how it is. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm going to slowly begin um, because we're also welcoming uh, audience on the live stream today. So we, that gives us a different kind of uh, timing uh, than what we normally have. Um, so expecting that people will be coming in, but we need to begin anyway. Um, so my name is Laura Cull O'Malaker. I'm the lecturer for the Academy of Theatre and Dance, one of the organising research groups for this lecture series. Um, and welcome to the, the last uh, lecture in this series, uh, Participation in Arts and Education. Very warm welcome to everybody who's joining us uh, online also. Uh, a great pleasure to have you with us um, and to everybody in the room. Um, and this last uh, lecture is on the theme of arts, dying and grief. Um, and perhaps we can begin by acknowledging that this lecture and this event is taking place at a time that is very full <laughs> of, of grief, um, that we're in a very dark <laughs> and difficult time at the moment in relation to what's happening in Gaza that produces a lot of uh, intense feelings that are welcome here. Um, so whatever feelings you might be bringing into this space in relation to that, whether that's uh, uh, distraction or anger or sadness, um, I hope we can all feel welcome to be in this space as we are and as we find ourselves today. So I'm very grateful that this lecture is happening today. There's nowhere else than this space that I would rather be, frankly, <laughs> um, right now. So thank you very much um, to our two guest presenters, um, Stacey Boucher uh, and Camille Sapara barton um, I'm going to begin by introducing Stacey, um, and then I'll introduce Camille uh, later before their presentation in the second half. So uh, Stacey is a curator, a writer, and holistic death care worker based in Utrecht, here in the Netherlands. Broadly, Stacey's work focuses on aesthetic and poetic practices of social reproduction and care work, as well as its manifestations in interpersonal relationships and daily life, community organizing and institutional practice. Their debut publication, uh, Dying Livingly is released with Sternberg Press in 2024. Which month exactly, Stacey? Do we know? Springtime. So we're looking forward to the launch of, of that book. Um, they currently teach at the Royal Academy of Art in The Hague. Um, Stacey was curator at Casco Art Institute, working for the Commons um, between 2017 and 2022. With Carmel Curtis, they co-curated Barbara Hammer Evidentiary Bodies at the Leslie Lohman Museum of Art in New York. Um, and they hold an MA from the Center for Curatorial Studies at Bard College. And for this presentation, um, Stacy is going to share with us about their long-term project, Dying Livingly, from which the book comes, a heightened period of study within the first few years of their holistic death care practice. Very much looking forward to it. Thank you, Stacey. Welcome. Yes. Hi, everyone. Oh. Also, hi to everyone uh, on the live stream. Many loved ones. I think my mom, so hello to my mom. Um, yeah, it's really nice to be here with you all. And um, I have to say, the microphone and the lighting makes me a little bit nervous. But also because um, this material um, uh, that I will share with you today is, I've also been holding it very close in my heart and through the writing process. And I'm just finishing up 
with the, the final manuscript. So I haven't really talked about it so much in this kind of public setting. So it does feel very emotional for me. Um, and in general, I also just feel deeply changed by this moment in time, um, bearing witness to the genocide that's unfolding in Palestine and, and Gaza. And um, it has certainly fortified my activism <laughs> um, and my solidarity with Palestinian people. Um, course for their self-determination and their dignity and their liberation um, but it's absolutely uh, stretched my sense of my death care um, my own and uh, others you know because death care is always um, it's always connected that my death care is related to your death care um, so I would say that my death care has also deepened, um, and it's been really challenging to write the book, um, or edit the book during the past two months. So um, I just want to, yeah, as Laura also already brought up, just bring this into the space. Um, So maybe we can start also just um, yeah, engaging with the breath a little bit uh, so we can arrive together like this. Um, I want to share something with you. Maybe you already know about it, um, but have you heard of the physiological sigh? Um, this is something that it has been really helpful for me. Uh, it's really like a, a bottom-up kind of reset, like engaging with the body. Um, that um, I mean, you all know about sighing, of course. And we sigh at least three times a day. Um, you also probably can recall when you sigh while you're yawning or while you're crying. Um, so, but in, an, in any case, the physiological sigh, um, it acts as a sort of reset button for our respiratory and nervous systems. Um, it plays a vital role in maintaining the balance between the sympathetic, the fight or flight, and the parasympathetic. Um, rest and digest, uh, these different branches of the autonomic nervous system. And so how it goes is that you do one big inhale followed by another quick, sharp inhale, and then you exhale very consciously and long. So it's kind of like this. So just an invitation to try it if you'd like. In that second quick, sharp inhale, it opens up the air sacs of your lungs, maybe the ones that are more dormant, to get also more um, oxygen. So, okay. Now maybe we can just start getting into a more steady rhythm of the breath. Finding that rhythm. And I find it really nice to also start, of course, you're engaging uh, the sensations in your face, feeling the inhale and exhaling. And then each time you inhale and exhale, you can bring the exhale lower. We can feel the exhale also in your throat. And then down to the chest. Down below the navel. And 
And I find always helpful just to think about how your exhale can be longer than your inhale. Okay. Thanks for doing that with me, with each other. Um, so as Laura already mentioned, I have a background in curating and writing. Um, I'm also a holistic death care worker and I would say just generally a care worker. Um, I've been deeply invested in um, what care work uh, looks like and means. And um, I've also been living and loving in disability communities for a long time. Um, and so this is also where I learn about caring practices and um, I would say that most of the caring practices that I have learned um, that really um, go against the normalization of um, reproduction of our lives uh, in, in this way that we live are really drawn from um, black and brown, often queer um, uh, people in the U.S. And this is really where I, I come from, uh, the U.S. And so a lot of the material that I've learned from and engaged with is also born out of that. So I just want to acknowledge that too. And um, yeah, maybe some of you um, have heard of holistic death care or you've heard of a death doula or a death midwife or death companion. Um, I call myself a death companion um, because I also like to think of myself as um, not only a friend to uh, the dying process, but also to death herself. Um, um, but for those that are like, huh, okay, what does that mean to be a death companion or a holistic death, death care worker? Um, most of all, I... Um, help guide the sanctity of the dying process and honor our dying loved ones and grievers. I would say that that's uh, first and foremost, but that always looks like something different. Um, mostly it's around uh, education, guidance, and support. I would say that the more that uh, we are informed about the dying process, about death, about grief, um, the more empowered we are to make decisions about how we engage with it. And so, um, uh, for me, this has mostly looked like, um, this has mostly looked like um, being in end of life care spaces. So situations of expected gradual death from uh, advanced aging, terminal illness, or maybe what's so-called natural death. Um, but I would have to say that, yes, uh, uh, as I mentioned over the past two months, I am, while I'm familiar with um, contemplative care and response ability to sudden death, I certainly feel uh, the expansion of my own death care in relationship to uh, violent death. And so, um, so, while I'm more familiar with these instances um, of gradual death, um, there are other sort of things. I, I'm, I'm also um, supportive for the, uh, in general, opening up to death wellness what it means to um, uh, build uh, mortality awareness and what it means to um, strengthen coping techniques and mechanisms for dealing with death anxiety and fear. And um, I'm also uh, uh, sometimes in the role of a companion for grief. And so most of the time it looks like one-on-one -on -one kind of care or that um, in this situation of a dying event that I'm 
most often, it seems, or so far for me, I'm um, working very closely with the most immediate caregiver of someone who's dying. Um, so uh, it's um, not only one-on-one -on -one work, you're always um, part of the, um, the village-making event of death. Um, so this has been, um, yeah, for the past few years, I've been um, deepening in this practice of holistic death care. Um, while I would say that uh, 2019, I knew for sure that I wanted to leave the art institution and go into more um, uh, actual service-based care work. Um, I had a lot of experience um, uh, with disability and elder justice, and um, once I started volunteering at a hospice uh, at the end of 2019, I was like, okay, you know, when all the lights kind of turn on and you know what you're doing, um, that's how it was for me. And so I went the route of um, doing <coughs> end of life doula training, um, and it's uh, been quite a journey of um, just truly expanding and, and continuing to study what that means to be in this role. And so, um, yeah, as Laura also mentioned, um, Dying Livingly, this name for the, my book that's coming out, um, but also um, it's the name of my um, research practice. It's been the place where I can see um, um, what I've come to understand working in art and culture, how it also relates with um, care practices. And what seems to be um, the red thread for me is that um, it always comes down to the material relational cultures of where um, care is happening, where dying is happening, and we know that that can be in many places. Um, but I've been um, mostly invested in, in thinking about uh, hospices <coughs> and this kind of uh, model of care. Um, hospice, whether in a facility or also hospice care at home. Um, but in general, I'm just drawn to the the aesthetic and poetic sensibilities that come from these material relational cultures. Um, and most of the time it's really in the um, sort of anecdotes or um, quite literally, um, you know, design proposals. And um, I, I know that even though I leave the art institution, I, uh, I mean, I don't leave it, obviously I'm still kind of in it right now, but, um, it's to say that um, Dying Livingly, for me, has found a way where my different concerns can sort of um, be entangled. Um, and um, it's really, yeah, it's really valuable for me. So I wanted to share with you a little bit about Dying Livingly uh, as it has manifested as a book. Um, I've also taught Dying Livingly as a, um, an independent study track at the Ka Beka. And that has also been a really beautiful experience to work with students um, about these um, aesthetic poetic sensibilities that I mentioned, but uh, also what it means for them to um, begin a journey with their own death care in a very conscious way and how that relates to um, their practice as artists. Um, I really tried to make clear to them too that um, you know, life is not something that begins later on when you're a professional artist or um, when you're achieving that goal later on or that sort of horizon, but actually life is now, it's happening right now. Um, so with this research, it's just been, um, yeah, just really incredible. And it uh, now has um, um, manifested into the book and, um, if I may share here, I just have a few documents that I also wanted to, um, oh, maybe you can't really read that. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah? Well, um, 
I thought that this is a way that I can also really, um, yeah, share with you the blurb for the book. It's the most succinct way that I could describe it. But of course, I want to describe a little bit more through the table of contents and then read a chapter for you. Um, but the one-liner, the, the zinger here, um, Dying Livingly is a, a series of propositions and encounters in service to an aesthetic and poetic experience of living life led by death. Part studious, part visceral, Dying Livingly is a collection of short essays and lyrical prose, if I may call them lyrical. I need to think about that. Um, written in the first few years of the author's holistic death care practice, with a focus on the material cultures and sociality of end-of-life spaces, the writing reaches toward a future of compassionate, community-centered end-of-life care, death care. Death has been outsourced, medicalized, and commodified for over a century. Existing at a threshold of innovation and transformation today, death is not a plight to master or transcend, but a reality of insistent change requiring our humble surrender. Working in tandem with the possibilities and limits of medicine, the holistic death care movement aims to support people and their communities in death literacy and phobia. It stewards both ancient and new practices in death care and centers social, political, and ecological imperatives for how we die. If death is an amplification of living, the intention here is on bearing witness to life in and around the dying. Living a death-oriented life is not simply for those and their loved ones navigating a terminal diagnosis and finite amount of time to live. It is for all of us. Death awareness leads to a valuing of life, which is urgently needed for justice, healing, and our livability. With fervor and deep reverence, this collection demonstrates that what is needed above all is a presence, simple but challenging, that refuses to look away as life slips from our grip. In this light, the writing details lessons and what it means to be prepared for death, but also impossibly ready, an ambivalent leap into the unknown. Death is a horizon that inspires us to live fully with the vulnerability necessary in giving and receiving care. Uh, thank you for listening and reading along. Um, I just want to uh, unpack a little bit uh, through the chapters, um, what I mean by part studious is, um, yeah, I have a background in writing research papers. And so it is very researched and sometimes a bit dense like that. But I also wanted to have the freedom um, to also share more personal experiences and also be a bit experimental in what literature can do. So I would say it's really half and half. Um, with Let's Hold Each Other Until It's All Over. It um, is um, dedicated to the artist Barbara Hammer, who I worked with in the years before her death, and I worked on uh, one of her retrospectives. So it's in part a, a eulogy to her. Um, Diane Livingly is also really um, unpacking the project um, over the past few years and this balance. Um, then I would say a working community of the unalike is a brief and partial history of um, the uh, Western hospice movement throughout the 20th century um, alongside, in tandem, because of um, the rise of hospitals and the medicalization of health and death. Um, this is also um, a chapter of really searching for um, what new end-of-life spaces, death and grief houses, what they could look like. Um, How to Wash a Body is something that I will read. Um, Compost Me is really um, uh, thinking about death awareness as well as um, ecological um, final disposition methods. Um, death realism is also, yeah, really taken to task right now, I would say, and, and how um, we have so much exposure to actual real death online and through social media. Um, and of course, well, I, I 
yeah, I, that's something I've been trying to think through the, the problem of representing death. Um, that pain, I mean, death, like pain, um, is always going to be um, sort of spilling over um, the possibilities of representation. And so I really tried to say that actually it's through uh, language, most of all, that we can share in the experiences of death and dying. Um, eulogy for before and after is also um, really paying respect to the charged, vibrating moments that occur before and after an event of death, and also the space where it takes place, where no matter what that space is, it becomes a sacred place. Um, Florida and North Carolina, um, it's really looking at um, what it means to be a death doula for your family who would never seek one out. Um, Grace's Hospice is um, s experimental in that I, um, I'm writing from the future in the mid-2030s from an experimental hospice, and it's uh, incorporating the design um, by one of my friends who's an interior architect. Um, Candle Triptych is really um, uh, explaining uh, a kind of history of candles candle lighting for the dead, and then also grounding into two rituals at the hospice where I volunteer. Um, as to Tomi, uh, it's actually the event of my uh, cat's death uh, from her perspective. This one is dedicated to me. Um, this, uh, she's the only one that actually dies in the book, while the book includes a lot of living and dead people. Um, Satomi is the only one that dies and um, it was an extremely reparative process to write that uh, experience. And then lastly, um, Deeply Forgetful is maybe the most <coughs> um, provocative, perhaps. Um, Deeply Forgetful is uh, inspired by Stephen Post's work on um, uh, reframing dementia towards the, the deeply forgetful and more dignified practices for um, living with our loved ones with dementia. So deeply forgetful is also, well, maybe it's provocative in a way that I also position um, those without dementia as the deeply remembering and what that means for these to coexist together. So thank you for listening to this um, this introduction to the book. Um, it is really exciting to share it. And um, I want to now give um, yeah, a taste of one of the chapters that I think finds a balance between um, um, that part studious, part visceral that I mentioned. And I will pull it up here also so that um, you can read along. Um, maybe also as an introduction, this is about um, what it means to try to prepare and the, the challenge to even fathom the death of um, your loved ones. Expand it. How's this? <laughs> oh, wider, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's a big screen, so that's great. Yeah? Hmm, how about that? Am I able to just expand it? Okay. You know, it's just hard when you're looking over here and trying to. Hey. 
Hey. Okay. But this also means that I need to read it from here, too. That's okay. Okay. It's titled How to Wash a Body, and it's dedicated to my partner, Lotta. On the floor in the living room, you lie on your back on top of a white sheet on our carpet. It's evening in cold January, and we have only the soft, warm light of the standing lamp. With all the curtains closed and our dog sleeping on her mat nearby, we are safe, protected, and calm. I am a little nervous. With my thumb and middle finger, I close your eyelids and remind you not to speak. You are playing dead, and I am practicing how to prepare a body for washing and dressing as part of my death doula training. Kneeling at your side, I try to gently roll your body with one hand on your hip and the other on your shoulder, pulling you towards me. I can feel your lively resistance, muscles flexing, yet I know you are leaning into your dead weight. There's only so much I can do by myself, but I want to see if I could roll you to one side and place a disposable pad underneath you. This way I could press on your abdomen to encourage any bodily fluids to escape and then replace the pad. You laugh because I look so serious. We are doing our best. It would be far easier to have four people, two on each side at each junction of the hips and shoulders. To move you would be better with six to 10 people. To move you would be better with six to 10 people, making sure to have at least one holding your feet together and another, God forbid it would roll your neck and head. I would have cut your shirt open to make it easier to remove, but we pretend that you are naked already and I cover your body with another white sheet. As the fabric rests over you, I think about the countless times I have seen this image of you draped in sheets while you slept. How fondly I regard a material simply because it gets to be so close to you. Your chest slowly rises and falls. I place the candle above your head Next to me are an assortment of items, scissors, incense, hydrogen peroxide, a trash bag, extra towels, the book Rose, Poems, by Li Young Li. Not that I would use all these materials, but I wanted to see what it is like to have some of them around me, prepared. I could arrive at any scene with my doula bag and be ready. From the kitchen, I grab a bowl of warm water and then add rose essential oil. In our shared silence, I light the candle. One of the most practical and profound acts of death care is that of physically, materially caring for our dead. For the last hundred years in North America and Europe, with the medicalization of death and death care industries, this act has been outsourced. This means that as soon as someone dies of expected death, the funeral home is contacted to come and collect the body of the newly deceased. And then there's embalming, dressing, and the addition of makeup, all at an eerie distance. We have enlisted their help because we believe that this is what we are supposed to do. But we are also disenfranchised by fear. This is fashioned as a loop without a clear beginning or end similar to other dilemmas in holistic death care, wherein our fear of death limits us in accessing alternative options. The funeral industry has taken over the task that we already anticipate as challenging to bear. That's a bear spell down there or think we aren't allowed to do safely or legally. We have intuitive knowledge of natural death care, since it is old as human time, but we have to be reminded of what we know. There are many funeral practitioners su who support family and community involvement, but not always. Most natural death care takes place at home, but it's still possible to arrange something at a hospice or hospital. With good collaboration between medical and funeral establishments, you can make many things happen. Having a holistic death care worker nearby or on call, someone with you whom you are already binded and trust, means having a personal advocate, one who will support you in being present for this process and remind you that you're doing it right, that all of this is normal. I wish for everyone to have this kind of experience directly after their loved one's death. This feels right to them and the cultural context allows. And for those who haven't, to have grace for themselves for what they didn't yet know or just simply wasn't possible. 
Any future moment in which you can be present with a dead body can be time used to grieve for all those others who you couldn't be with before. Now, with everything prepared for the bathing ritual, I begin at your head and I explain what I am going to do, imagining that in the future I would be guiding loved ones in these actions while I was at their side, the highest honor possible. My role is to support and empower families, caregivers, and loved ones to care for their dead. But my role is also to hold the space with thoughtfulness and intention, help give structure and slow things down. Often there is an impulse to act as if an emergency. But right after a gradual death, it is important to do as little as possible and in no rush. Now's the time to connect with the profundity of it all in this sacred space and experience just how very alive you feel. There will be plenty of actions and decisions today to take. For now, just wait. Intuitively and with support, you will know when it's time to do the next thing. With you, I will only rehearse this once. I wasn't going to wash your curls with shampoo, but I gesture as if I did, rubbing your skull with my fingertips. I know this feels good to you. While I narrate my actions, I think about how healing can be spurred in the act of saying what is materially happening. I say how I would clean your mouth as you lie there quiet and motionless. Then I use the washcloth to clean your face. Gliding the cloth across your forehead and brow, I whisper to you, for all that you have known and seen, and think about how you have known and seen me in ways I can't and won't fully comprehend. My erect finger within the cloth runs down each of your cheeks along your nose and encircles your mouth. For all that you have smelt and tasted, I say, and I think about your body's unique fragrance. It changes, but it doesn't grow old to me. And then I think about most of you, <laughs> most of you I've held in my mouth. I remind myself to breathe as I follow your jawline for all that you have spoken and heard. I think about how I can't fathom living without you, but how I would learn to figure it out. You've had to figure out how to grieve a former version of yourself now that long COVID has fundamentally altered your life. There will be so much that we figure out together. I sail down the nape of your neck to your collarbone and shoulders. <coughs> then I wrap a silk floral scarf around your head to keep your jaw closed before rigor mortis would set in. And then I slowly move down your body like a meditative scan. I bathe one uncovered limb at a time. I place my hand between your legs in motion as if I were to wash you there, here. This is what I would likely do for families in case they didn't feel comfortable doing so themselves. But in this instance, I glance over to find your smirk. With my hand, I have loved you. Your love for me comes from a well that I helped dig. How we interact in the hours after a death can serve us very well. Touch helps us to understand. We witness and start to accept the beginning of cascading losses as the b body begins to change. We see ourselves in each other, humbled by the mi miracle of life and death. Here we were, very alive, softening a fear, playing pretend. Emotional boundaries are paramount when doing this work. Soft front, strong back, as Death Gula Lua Arthur says. But when it is someone you know that you love, all sides are soft. You will never be fully prepared. Ritual, some physical practice enmeshed with, I with an idea of feeling, helps to acknowledge a transition to mark reality and steward a reformation. I trust that it will be there when I need it. Sitting next to you, I end the ritual by reading the poem from Blossoms by Li, Li Young Li. The last stanza reads, there are days we live as if death were nowhere in the background from joy to joy to joy, from wing to wing, from blossom to blossom, to impossible blossom, to sweet impossible blossom. Your body begins to wiggle as you wrestle out from under the sheet. You reach for me as I help to lift you up. Thank you. Uh, in light of this, I also just want to share um, something that I was I mentioned to Camille earlier that um, so much focus of the holistic death care movement has been about providing a good death 
ends. I wish these kind of moments for everyone because it's very clear what a bad death is. And, you know, if I can make the, the radical claim that I think death phobia um, is perhaps, or our inability to maybe be close to death uh, in these ways, or the removal, the slow decades of removal of this, um, it is just so directly linked to the devaluing of life. Um, so I hope that um, this can also be resonant um, that um, everyone deserves a good death and it feels kind of wild to say that um, but also all the more important um, that it's mentioned. So thank you. Thank you very much, Stacey. Um, we have about 10 minutes uh, for questions uh, before we take a break. So I'd like to invite any thoughts or questions or responses. Thanks. Um, thanks for sharing. Uh, I'm sitting with this question for myself as someone who has washed dead bodies. If you would talk or maybe talk into, I'm sitting with the question, why choose a living person? And yeah, just curious if you have any reflections on that or what mm. maybe that offers or uh, yeah, or maybe even if it's a personal reason that you're willing to share. Yeah, mm. thanks. Um, thank you. Uh, no, it's just um, a matter of timing. Um, before I had washed other bodies, or guided, uh, more so guided others in washing bodies. Um, yeah, I was just doing the training. So um, I hadn't yet had the opportunity. And so um, living with my partner uh, and wanting to have a sense of what that would feel like um, to put to practice what I learned. Um, that, that was really it. Uh, um, yeah, the reason that the first time of practicing was with someone um, who was living. Hi, thank you. Um, I've seen you also practicing in the other event of If I Can't Dance. Mm. So nice to see you again. Um, I wanted yeah. to ask you. I yeah. remember you. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> I wanted to ask you um, for yourself, like uh, how, I mean, I think it's a bit big question, but how do you um, yeah, l sit with yourself right after taking care of someone and going through this process? Uh, which I assume not always you have emotional connection with the person or like how then this process mm. also goes like when you leave and you basically take care of yourself mm. after, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have different um, rituals for entry and exit uh, when having certain encounters. Um, but even also, yeah, going to the hospice and not knowing perhaps what's behind the door or what has changed since the last time I, I was there, that there are just certain things that I try to do before and after. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a wide range of them. It also kind of depends. Um, 
But I would say in general, what's really helpful for me is um, uh, distinguishing between um, how I practice empathy and compassion, the difference between those, and how compassion helps me to hold myself together and separate, together connected but separate. Um, uh, and that way I'm able to be very present, whereas with empathy, as I understand it, you really take a lot in <laughs> as your own, and sometimes in that sense, um, well, we can see that when we're empathizing, perhaps it might, we might even somehow physiologically sense that it's happening to us, or uh, it's, yeah, so differentiating um, helps me in general, but um, yeah, as I also think a lot about this biopsychosocial model of pain and grief, um, I try to also, uh, biopsychosocial as in uh, bio, the body, uh, psycho, the, the mind, and social um, relations and environment, that like pain and grief is always happening in these three domains, never just one. Um, when I decompress or I'm in my entry exit moments, I try to also um, touch on each of those realms. So doing something with my body, doing something with my mind, doing something with my environment and my relations. So it, it, it depends. It could be like a certain shower where I also imagine all of the water um, washing something, an experience off of me and going down the drain. It's to recharge, you know, from that. Or, yeah, or I uh, intensely clean the house. You know, just different things. Um, uh, and it always seems to be uh, changing with each uh, changing moment. And when I know that, oh, I don't have the time to do a proper exit for myself, then I just make a, a promise. Once I am, I'm going to do this, that, and the other. Thanks. Hi, thank you for. Uh, y you were talking about uh, washing the body, and I uh, can I understand that as washing a corpse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, um, what about the immaterial part of this ritual? So um, mm. of ritual of washing ritual, uh, the mind, or maybe uh, s some say the soul. So you have the corpse, uh, you care about the corpse and mm. the environment, the people that are there, I suppose. But what about the yeah. The immaterial part of the body mind. The soul or like um I, the yeah, the if spirit. you believe in a soul, the yeah. spirit, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, it um um really depends on the situation and the person. And um there are um of course different religious practices um, and cultural practices for how to wash a, bo uh, a body, a corpse, and different prayers that are said, different practices of anointment, different things that you do. Um, and I, um, yeah, I don't, um, I don't come in with an agenda about how that would be done when I'm with others. Uh, for example, at the hospice, um, sometimes you don't get the chance to have this sort of sacred ritual uh, framing of the event of washing, you know? It sometimes it's a uh, practical. And, um, you know, it depends on, on who you're with and their beliefs and what matters. And then, you know, this is not something usually from from my position as a companion that I just rock up there and um, uh, just uh, 
wing it. Um, and these are my experiences with um, expected gradual death. Then in that instance, I would be um, talking to this circle of uh, care, the circle of loved ones, um, about how they would like to have it done. So it, it's also incredibly important. I just, um, yeah, I myself am still um, learning and engaging with spirit and what that means for me as well. Um, and more so in general, keeping myself very open to what other people want. And uh, yeah. We maybe have time for, for one more, if there's one more question. Yeah. Thanks, Stacy. Yeah. Um, I'm really curious about your, your idealized vision for hospice care that was really, yeah, rooted in, in practices of reverence of life, but also mm outside of this death phobic context that we're very much still in in the Western world. So it's cu I'm curious about the whole book and can't wait to read it, but that chapter, I guess, might be an insight, but I'm, I'm interested, yeah, what that would look like to you. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, well, I would say that um, um, the legacy that I feel part of and which I'm most inspired by throughout my research of the hospice movement uh, were the um, community, uh, the social models of hospice that were cropping up during the AIDS crisis in the US and in other places as well, but that's also where I really studied. And um, mostly the form of hospice, which are called Omega homes. And these were really, um, yeah, they were born out of need. You know, so uh, many people who are dying from AIDS were also dying alone in hospitals with so much stigmatization um, about the disease. And um, a lot of houses, a lot of people's homes were being opened up for um, people to come and die there. And then it was really the community um, took part in that process. And so um, I think um, what we can engage with today really calls upon um, some of these practices that we saw that were also very um, material, like just uh, embracing someone's home, opening it up, and saying that this can happen here. Um, uh, in general, I, I do get excited about like experimental architecture. Um, and we're constantly trying to create new things to accommodate for like the inhospitable, like the challenging parts about living. I mean, even in these amazing dementia villages that are created, it's so incredible. But then at the same time, it's like, we have to keep making a separate thing. Um, so, but the experimental architecture uh, is just more that I think that we need to bring back the, um, you know, the aesthesis, the, uh, you know, the opposite of anesthesia. We need to bring back the senses and that is felt in these, in these places. Um, we can rethink the ways in which um, hospice rooms, for example, are designed. Do they need to just have w one door uh, that goes in and out? Like, can we also rethink um, how we gather around the dying for more compassion and dignity? But it would also mean that um, uh, these kind of new hospices would be, um, yeah, adaptable. Um, there would have to be different economic models outside of um, how medicalized hospice has become. And um, they would need to be culturally specific and have, um, yeah, the uniqueness um, that's, uh, yeah, related to certain communities uh, and cultures. And um, in general, becoming a bit more crafty about how we can also um, 
change a space to be more accessible for fragile bodies. And so maybe that's like a little bit of um, what I would say, but I would, they would definitely be a death doulas part of hospices. Um, I mean, hospice volunteers are also death care workers, but it's just, you know, death doulas are also changing things and they're not really um, so welcome in all hospices. So the whole relational uh, fabric would be, um, yeah, really dealt with in a, in a new way. Thank you yeah. so much, Stacey, also for uh, the answers to the questions and, and the presentation. It was really, I feel very privileged to be the, the first yeah. audience uh, to the book. Really, thank you all for listening and to, yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful for your attention thank and time. You. So let's um <laughs> let's take a, a five minute break uh, for drinks or move around. I don't really know how that works on a live stream. <laughs> uh, live stream people, maybe you can also get a cup of tea, have a stretch, um, and we'll try and yeah reconvene in about five minutes time.
Hello. <laughs> We're going to get started again. So welcome back, everybody, also online. And I'm really pleased to introduce our, uh, our second speaker uh, for today, who's Camille Sabar Sapara Barton. Uh, Camille is a social imagineer who operates as a catalyst for social change dedicated to creating networks of care and livable futures. They work as an artist, facilitator, consultant, curator across the realms of embodied social justice, grief, pleasure, and drug policy. Rooted in black feminism, ecology, and harm reduction, Camille uses creativity alongside embodied practices to create culture change in fields ranging from psychedelic assisted therapy to arts education. In 2022, Camille launched the Gen Grief Toolkit, uh, which some of you may already know, a collection of embodied grief rituals to support personal and community grief work. They are currently based here in Amsterdam, where they recently finished working as the director of the Ecologies of Transformation, um, a temporary master's program at the Sandberg Institute, researching how art making and embodiment can create social change. Um, and we're very honored to also be celebrating uh, Camille's forthcoming book. So we are the, the, the special uh, privileged audiences for these two very important publications. So uh, congratulations also for that and welcome. Hi everyone, it's good to be with you today. Um, yeah, really happy to have been able to listen to Stacy. We've been in shared spaces online, but this is the first time we're meeting in real life. So yeah, it's very special. Um, yeah, I think the first thing I, I would like to do is just introduce myself a little bit more in terms of just lineage and the ancestral lineages that, that I come from. Um, so I am Yoruba, which is an indigenous community to Nigeria, Guyanese, and also Celtic and English. Um, I was raised in London, but I've also been shaped by Oakland and the Bay Area in the US, on unceded Ohlone land, and also Berlin. I've been in Amsterdam for two and a half years now. I'm very interested in different approaches to culture change, um, particularly thinking about how we do that through the body, given that in the West there's often a fixation on language and uh, certain principles that often aren't put into practice. So I'm interested in what the practices are that actually can have us live in alignment with our values. And for me, grief work is a really important component of that of actually noticing what we care about, what moves us, what we want to live for, and what we're ultimately willing to pivot in order to um, yeah, feel an integrity with how we want to live our lives. Um, I'm going to speak today about some of the sort of core components that make up my book. I'm not going to go into a deep dive, um, as Stacey beautifully did today. Um, but many of these themes and the things I'm going to touch upon um, are in my upcoming book, Tending Grief. But in the last six or seven years of, of my own kind of journey with grief work, I've really noticed the, the need for grief tending in social movements, um, but also in daily life, because at least in the Western context, we seem to have removed a lot of the practices um, to actually be with discomfort, to be with loss and sorrow, and particularly in moments like this that we're living through with the siege on Gaza, but also the other conflicts, 
and sites of pain um, taking place in the world, I think it's important for us to be able to cultivate the capacity to actually feel what's going on without just being overwhelmed, without bypassing, numbing away, but actually regaining that capacity to notice and sense what's happening so that we can be in relationship to it and really decide what actions we want to take, what world we want to be growing and uh, moving towards together. So in noticing the kind of lack of these grief tools um, and going into my own deep grief journey for the first time in 2017, um, this led me to try and develop my own rituals and practices to navigate my own grief um, but also kind of seed some frameworks that might be useful for activists, change makers, and artists. And this led to the Gen Grief Toolkit, which some of you may have come across before. Um, and is very much sort of the, I guess, the framework for which Tending Grief, the new book, emerged from. I feel that the story we tell about grief has deep implications for how we approach the global challenges we face. So I think ultimately, touching in on what Stacy was speaking to, in the Western world, grief is still very taboo. We don't have a lot of public space to speak about it, let alone process it together. And as a result of it being taboo, it's often individualized and privatized. Maybe we are told to go see a therapist and talk about it with them. But oftentimes those therapists might encourage us to just sort of get over it quickly so that we can become productive workers again. Because much of our healthcare and mental health care is actually based on how productive we are as workers, rather than, I don't know, other metrics that might be more useful for us. And ultimately this, this grief being taboo um, leads to a sense in our societies of it being inconvenient and having no inherent purpose or worth. And um, so what we tend to do is numb ourselves, whether through alcohol, drugs, shopping, whatever it may be, scrolling on our phones, we tend to numb ourselves um, because we're consistently getting these messages that this isn't useful, this is a waste of time, we have to get over it. We have to focus on something else. So I'm very curious about what it looks like to lean into some of the different approaches to grief tending that still exist in many different parts of the world, often within indigenous cosmologies, um, that often see grief as a generative force, as something that can actually enhance our lives, that can give us clarity and help us move towards the worlds that we want to live in and find our place in shaping those worlds as well and using our gifts and service of life and the collective. I do think that tending grief and rebuilding this capacity is going to be important um, in order for us to get back to the right relationship with each other, with the planet, um, and hopefully lead us towards livable futures. I want to share a quote uh, by Malkia Devich Cyril, who is an activist and organizer in the US, who talks about grief not being the opposite of joy, but grief being the opposite of indifference. And so when we care about things, when we love things, we often grieve them because they've meant something to us, they impact us. And so I'm curious about what it means to kind of hold that relationship rather than it being inconvenient and something we need to move away from. So as we move through this, I would invite you to just track any sensations that are coming up in your body. Um, there's a lot of information that, that comes from, from our bodies. Uh, despite all the body-mind separation that's very common in the West, there's a lot going on here. So if you notice moments of contraction, heat shifting, relaxation, I would just invite you to track that. And it's all good information. And before I get into some more 
content, I'm actually going to invite you to join me in a little centering practice. Um, so if you would like to do that, I invite you to get comfortable <coughs> in your seat. And I invite you to close your eyes if that feels comfortable, or you can gently rest your gaze somewhere in the space. And I invite you to begin by just noticing any sensations arising in your body in this moment. And then noticing any places where your body is being supported. This might be your back or your pelvis against the chair or the soles of your feet against the floor. Just noticing these places where there's connection and support. And if it feels comfortable, I'd invite you to place a hand on your belly or somewhere in the center of your body. Noticing this connection, this warmth from your hand. And I'm gonna invite you to begin by trying to center in your length. So really noticing the full length of your body moving up your chest, maybe along your spine, really feeling the length of your spine and along your neck, out the top of your head. And also noticing that length below the pelvis, along your legs, down to your feet, to the floor, centering on your right to life, safety, dignity, and belonging, just like all other beings, centering in that. And then I invite you to center in width, so really feeling your fullness. You might like to find a place in the center of your chest and allow that to expand outwards across your shoulders and your arms, moving down your arms. Maybe finding another place in the center of your belly and expanding outwards to your hips, feeling the edges of your hips and your legs really taking in your fullness, taking up space, noticing that this dimension of our bodies is how we find interdependence, connection and relationship with others and our ecosystems. And then centering in depth, I invite you to notice your back body Maybe a place along your spine or the back of your head, back of your legs. Noticing that our ancestors are at our backs. Could be biological ancestors or those who we feel in lineage with or in connection to. Continuing their legacy I invite you to move from the back and notice the front body. This could be the front of your face, your chest, maybe the front of your legs. Noticing this is how we often move outwards towards action, hopefully in alignment and integrity with the lineages we're a part of. Bringing that all together and just taking a few breaths to notice any sensations arising for you now. And then when you're ready, you can gently maybe bring some movement into your fingers and your toes. You can open your eyes if they've been closed. And 
bring in any other movement that feels good as we come back into the space. Hmm. Okay, thank you. So yeah, feel free to stay attuned to whatever sensations move, move with you for the rest of this presentation today. Okay. So my own personal deep dive into grief really took place for the first time in 2017. And the, the thing that catalyzed it was actually an abortion, which I was very present in my decision for having. So I was quite shocked to be kind of submerged in grief after this experience. And I felt a lot of anger and rage about the lack of public space to be with this experience, which is incredibly common in many places in the world. Um, and this sense that I needed to somehow hide in a corner and deal with it on my own. Um, so through this, I, I decided I want to kind of meet this experience and find ways to hold this, this grief, this sorrow that's in my body and changing my perception of life as I know it. Um, so I created and experimented with different rituals and different practices to actively be with the grief that was arising for me. And yeah, that led to a lot of experiences taking place during this time that kind of put that to the test, including losing my home to a house fire during that time, including supporting my partner through the death of a parent. Um, it felt like there was kind of a bit of a grief tornado that happened as I was committing to being in relationship with my grief. It was kind of a domino effect in many ways. Like as I centered on recovering in my body, mind, and also spirit, um, other things dredged up to the surface. So previously dissociated memories of abuse from childhood came back and was suddenly something that I needed to also attend to. So it's been a good old seven years next spring of this process of things arising, meeting it, being with it, and noticing how I've shifted and continue to transform in the process. And as much as it's been very challenging, it's also been incredibly generative for giving me a sense of who I am, what my values are, what I wanna be in relationship to, and continually having to check if I'm in integrity with that and pivot when I'm not. So as, as difficult as it has been, it's, um, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it. My approach to grief tending is incredibly influenced by these two people, uh, these ancestors, Maladoma Somme and Sabonfu Somme. They're indigenous to the Dagara people who are based in what we now call Burkina Faso in West Africa. And I had the pleasure of going to a grief ritual held by Sobonfu within the Dagara cosmology in 2015 when I was living in the Bay Area. Unfortunately, uh, both Sobonfu and Maladoma are no longer alive, but their legacy and their work lives on, and they had a profound impact on grief tending work in the Western world. Spent a lot of their lives um, contributing to this kind of lineage re-emerging. What I think is most important to share about the Dagara approach to grief is that um, in contrast to the West, it's actually taboo to not tend your grief <laughs> in the Dagara context. So there is generally a monthly grief ritual that everyone is expected to attend because they believe that unprocessed grief actually becomes harm or violence or something quite destructive in the collective. That the suppressing, the pushing down of these emotions actually has negative ramifications for everyone. And so people are expected to show up and be in active relationship with their grief. 
but Agara also believed that doing this removes stagnation, allows for deepening of relationship, allows for us to share our gifts, and ultimately um, maintain the, the relationship between ancestral wisdom and what's happening in the material realm. They also, in commenting on the West, where they both spent a lot of their adult lives after leaving Burkina Faso, um, they commented in their writings that they feel the suppression of grief in the West is actually a form of social control. That it um, means that we're more uh, malleable, that we are able to be coerced more towards business as usual because we're often not in touch with our sensing and our feeling um, that these parts of ourselves have been demonized and so it actually means we're it's harder for us to move towards the changes that we might intellectually want. And um, yeah, their work has had profound impact on me and although I'm not part of the Dagara cosmology, I do have a similar belief that untended grief does have harm, that that is a part of what we're dealing with now in this moment, is hundreds of years of untended grief. And that um, part of moving towards different futures is to re-engage this muscle, this remembering and this ongoing practice so that we can clear stagnation and be more present and attuned to what we actually want, what we're, what we're calling in. I also want to share this quote by Cindy Milstein, who is the editor of a really great anthology called Rebellious Morning, which is specifically looking at grief tending within social movements, um, predominantly social movements within the Americas. So I come to this anthology through my own pain, yet it is inseparable from the pain of the world. This pain laid bare much cruelty some of it systemic, some of it due to socialization. One of the cruelest affronts, though, was the expectation that pain should be hidden away, buried, privatized, a lie manufactured so as to mask and uphold the social order that produces our many unnecessary losses. When we instead open ourselves up to the bonds of loss and pain, we lessen what debilitates us. We reassert life and its beauty. We open ourselves up to the bonds of love, expansively understood. Yeah, I resonate. So, why is grief important to consider in relation to the arts or art making? Well, I have lots of thoughts on this, but to just highlight a few of them. Despite artists in the West often feeling like we're special unicorns that are separate from the rest of society, we are actually a part of society. We're workers. We are part of this economy, and many of us identify as storytellers, trying to mirror things in the society. Many of us want to create change, identify as change makers. And so as a result of being part of the, the microcosm of the macrocosm, many of us are still perpetuating this story of grief, of it being an individualized, privatized affair, of it being something that we need to shove down into a corner and move away from. As a result, I think a lot of the art that is being made um, is not necessarily reckoning with the worlds that we, that we want to create and how in practice we get there. There's often a chasing of peak experiences or certain aesthetics um, that may shock and awe but aren't necessarily getting to the root of what these changes um, would mean or would take, let alone inspire others to walk down those paths. I created Ecologies of Transformation because I 
I did notice this dynamic of shock and awe of us in many realms, not just the arts, but believing that if we bombard people with something, then that creates change. But from a body perspective, from a nervous system perspective, that actually just creates overwhelm. And what do we do when we're overwhelmed? We often bypass, we move away from, we ignore. So I got very curious, what would it look like to create art in a way, especially socially engaged art, around complex and maybe challenging themes, to create it in such a way that people could receive the information more deeply, that they wouldn't bypass, that they were lovingly called in and actually inspired to reflect on the kind of relationships they want to have and they want to participate in. I've also noticed in museums and galleries that even when there's quite heavy work on quite heavy themes, there is an expectation that we should feel no emotion in these spaces. To cry in a gallery or a museum is also taboo. Even when the work might be entangled with our ancestral pain or state violence that our communities have experienced. There are some exceptions, some curators and museum workers who are trying to change this. Um, I was actually brought in by the civics department at the Serpentine in London to do a grief training for their stewards um, during the Radio Ballads exhibition, which was about the care, um, kind of people who had been living in the care system, as well as those who'd experienced domestic violence, other state violence. And the curators and civics team really understood. They wanted people coming in and engaging with this work to feel that they could release what comes up. And so that also meant creating a container where the stewards could know how to hold space, and what their boundaries could be, but how they could be present to that. So there is some change, but I would say examples like that are quite rare currently. There is still this expectation that we intellectually engage with art rather than allow it to move through our bodies and change us, transform us. I also think in this moment, as the war machine rages, we need to question how radical art is in and of itself. How radical is our art making if we're not critiquing um, economies built off endless death and war and necropolitics? Creative expression in individual contexts is not gonna magically fix things in and of itself. So what does it look like to create art that invokes the collective, that doesn't reinforce the status quo? that potentially speaks to changing social conditions. I think that grief work can be a, a compass to allow us to explore some of these things by first noticing what we long for as well as what causes us huge amounts of pain and needs to shift in order for us to live lives that feel worth living. So, if you would like to, feel free to do something else if you would not like to participate, but I'm gonna lead um, a short exercise to just notice if you can sense where grief may be in your body. It's gonna be about five minutes. Um, you can participate if you want to, but no pressure. So I would invite you, if you'd like to participate, to close your eyes if that feels comfortable. Or you can gently rest your gaze somewhere in the space. Again, noticing any places of support and connection between your chair and your back body maybe the soles of your feet with the floor. And then I'd invite you to scan your body and find the place that feels most pleasant in this moment. A place that feels a bit better than other parts of your body without you having to do anything to it. 
looking for someone that experiences physical pain, the invitation is to find a place that feels neutral. But once you've found this place that feels most pleasant in your body, the invitation is just to be with it with some breaths, noticing any ripples or shifts in sensation. And as you're doing this, if you feel any tension or discomfort, you can just stop. But if this is feeling like it's reducing stress or it's grounding in some way, I invite you to notice what signals your body is giving you that this is grounding or reducing stress in some way. Some examples might be your belly softening, your breath deepening, or maybe some other signals. And I invite you to ask this place in your body that feels most pleasant. Where do I feel grief in my body? Where do I feel grief in my body? And invite you to notice any sensations, any images, memories that provide information about where you might feel grief in your body. being with this for a couple more breaths. And when you're ready, you're bringing some movement into your fingers and your toes. And gently open your eyes and come back into the space. Well, thank you for giving that a go. And for those who decided not for them, thank you for listening to what you needed as well. Um, I think practices like this can be a, a little entry point for further exploration if it feels useful. So, I ultimately am a believer that we need a whole diversity of tactics and approaches to create livable futures. But I do think that grief tending can be one of those threads at least for me, is a very important thread in order to, I guess, move beyond numbing and start feeling into and sensing our bodies again and being in relationship to that. Changing the stories that we tell about grief and about its role so we can hopefully support younger generations in particular to have ways to move through difficult emotions and allow that to fuel them rather than hinder them hopefully slow down enough to make choices that don't repeat the same dynamics and systems that we seek to move out of. And hopefully compost individualism and systems of domination that still permeate a lot of how our societies are structured in the West and many other places in the world. I hope that artists Storytellers and change makers can also experiment with grief tending 
and think about how it can be woven into creative practice to make this more accessible for other people, especially when the material may already be challenging, really inviting you to consider how you're making space for those emotions to be present and welcome and supported enough to be felt in relation to your work. Yeah, and finally, before some questions, this is the cover of my book that's coming out in the spring. Um, it, yeah, is a combination of essays that speak to many forms of collective grief that we experience, whether through colonization, assimilation, mental health, crisis, abortion, um, yeah, the many, many forms of grief that we often don't feel permission to tend to. Um, it also contains some interviews with artists in London um, who are using creative approaches to tend to grief in their respective communities, as well as um, the contents, adapted contents of the grief <coughs> toolkit, so practical rituals to use alone or with people to begin tending grief really with a focus on staying connected to the body so we can build our capacity to be with bigger sensations without becoming overwhelmed, without bypassing, kind of titrating and growing this muscle for feeling more deeply again. So it's available for pre-order and if you want to stay in touch or pre-order the book, you can find information through my website or through Instagram. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Cami. Um, yeah, it was a beautiful presentation and so much, so many connections I know for a lot of people in the room who are working also in relation to this, uh, mm. this area. So thank you so much. Um, we have some time again for questions uh, or thoughts or responses. Thank you. <laughs> um, Stacey talked about finding a, a place between um, empathy and compassion where you can be um, involved but also separate. Mm. Um, in relation again to all the violence that we're seeing at the moment in the Middle East, um, could you say how you manage that, how you manage that grief? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for the question. It's honestly something that's changing week to week for me. Um, one of the most important things I'm trying to do is stay connected to my embodied practices that resource me. So as much as possible, I can actually feel what's going on. Because especially with social media, which I'm still, you know, using, I've had breaks, a few weeks, not at all. And then last week, I actually went back into Instagram and found myself, you know, going on spirals for a few hours. And um, I'm really aware when that happens that I feel so out of my body and this very heightened, anxious state. So I'm trying to find strategies to stay aware of what's happening um, and informed whilst really m managing my social media use to minimize it as much as I can. Um, but also after social media coming back to something that resources me, whether it's tremoring practice or body scanning or yoga, whatever it is, but just trying to come back into the body um, and stay with sensation rather than being dissociated. With that, I also want to acknowledge that we are still being forced to work to survive and meet our basic needs. And it's not always possible to be feeling everything and doing what we need to do day to day. So I'm also making space for the moments where I do have to turn my attention elsewhere but making kind of dates in my diary for grief rituals. For me, my baseline is once a month. In this time, it's been more frequent. Um, but there's a practice in the book and in the Gen Grief Toolkit uh, called the Grief Jar. So I just have a jar that's on my altar. When I'm feeling grief emerge, I tend to write down what's happening on a small piece of paper. If I don't have time to deal with it then, I put it in the jar, knowing that I have my regular date to come and be with that and feel the feelings more deeply. Um, so for me, it's just, I suppose, noticing when I have space and time to feel, if I know I don't, making a time when I can, 
and just really trying to stay connected to my body and noticing what my what my role can be, like what my gifts actually can be in this moment. Um, I used to be someone that felt like more of a frontline activist and that's not the case for me anymore. And so I'm also having to figure out other ways of being in support that feel aligned um, to also give me time to tend to this and this coming out in the world in a way that's gonna support most people. And so, yeah, I think for anyone who's curious about your roles shifting or different ways of engaging. I really recommend the social ecosystem map by Deepa Aya, which kind of outlines some of the different roles within um, a social change ecosystem, because sometimes we can feel like there's only one way to be an activist, there's only one way to engage in change work. And actually there are so many different roles that are needed and will often take many during the course of our lifetimes and those can shift and change. So, yeah, those are just some things that arise to that, so thank you. Hi, uh, thank you very much. My question is maybe to the both of you, um, because yeah, you say it's um, also about social change. Um, and you also talked about the hospice and people that die and who are the, the loved ones. Is this always um, or related to or limited to humans or does it go beyond human beings? I'm just curious about this. Do you agree with uh, landscapes, uh, animals, um, languages, traditions, something? Yeah, I love this question, thank you. Um, definitely, for me, it's not limited to the human. Um, I grew up in the West, but I'm very recently from indigenous people <laughs> and connected to that cosmology and trying to learn more about that cosmology. And yeah, for us, it's very animist, like the earth is alive, everything is alive. Um, and so for me, I definitely feel a lot of grief around our ecosystems, around economies that are destroying different parts of the planet. And so in my framing, it's very much around you know, how we get into right relationship with all of the the ecosystems we're part of, not just humans. Um, but yeah, I think there can be a lot of grief that we're all feeling, but again, just trying to, m to push it away because we don't know what to do and perhaps going into the heartbreak and letting ourselves fall apart in certain moments can actually start to give the clarity around what we long for and what we might have to change or pivot in our own lives and in how we do things. Um, but I think that that is part of the gateway of it is to starting with the feeling rather than just intellectualizing because that's, I think, part of uh, the issue actually is trying to think we can solve everything with logic when that's just one, that's just one frame. It's not the whole, yeah, it's not the whole. I don't know what you think, Stacey. So that really resonates what you're saying for me. And also such a beautiful question. And I would say in general, um, my own death care feels like a reparative um, practice also with my uh, colonial lineages. And, um, and I'm, I'm finding more and more ways in which um, my death care and grief care, so connected, and life care, also so <laughs> connected, can be supportive of more than human life. So um, there's a lot of processes in my own um, um, mortality awareness of helping to dissolve myself, which helps to bring up uh, the value of all living things around me. So it. It's a, it's definitely a practice, um, but I would say maybe in short, yes. Mm. Any last questions? Um, with your book coming out, um, uh, let me 
me try to see how to formulate this question. Um, it's it's more about your um, your imagination, your desire, about how you can, um, uh, yeah, how you see people engaging with the book, mm. um, and of course, I I also imagine that you are very open to how people choose to do so, but um, when you think about yourself also returning to it. Um, is it in bits and parts? Do you get through halfway? Like, how, how do you imagine it will be engaged with mm. as an um, embodied experience of reading and being with and relational and mm. shared amongst people? Mm, thank you. Um, I really hope it will be a tool for practice. I don't think um, just reading the book I mean, reading the book might do things for people. That would be nice. But I'm really hoping that there can be networks of practice, people in regular grief practice, and hopefully um, a whole network of grief tenders or grief practitioners who are holding space in their own communities to do this work on a monthly or more frequent basis. Um, so I hope it becomes a site of inspiration for ongoing practice and experimentation. I don't think this is like a monolithic thing that's meant to just stay preserved. Um, I hope that people will research their own cultural lineages that may have been hidden or assimilated away in their own death practices and grief practices and maybe use some of the rituals in here as a frame to merge with others that may have been forgotten and you know, to create these different, as you were saying earlier, culturally specific approaches to grief tending um, because so much has been removed, it's like there's there's a huge amount of space to create and envision um, how we build that space. So I hope it, yeah, catalyzes the building of a network of people in practice around embodied grief work, um, and that it also inspires people to develop more somatic skill. Because in looking at what's happening now and the amount of trauma <laughs> that um, people already have and are gonna, you know just thinking about Palestinian children who are gonna grow up in the years to come, it's not just a case of holding grief space. I think we also need to develop trauma-informed somatic care practices and for that to not just be held by a small group of professionals but more normalized in our community contexts. Um, so I'm thinking a lot about the overlap between grief and trauma recovery. There's some overlap but they're also separate in some ways and I'm trying to figure feel into that so that the way I share about the book can hopefully safeguard people but also point towards maybe the area that people might want to feel into more of developing those skills to really hold um, not only grief but how we recover from trauma as well yeah mm. Well, perhaps <coughs> with that, we can uh, thank Kami uh, very much for their, their talk. Uh, we have pre-ordered the book uh, <laughs> for the, the library. Um, and yeah, really looking forward to delving further into it. But thank you so much uh, for the presentation. Also to uh, Stacy and for, uh, for all of the, the questions. It was a really great way to finish the series. Thank you so mm. much. Thank you. And there are drinks and snacks.